It gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Anne Goldsworthy. Yes, we have a new curriculum. Yes, you know, you've got to make a lot of changes, I know, but let's think about what really matters. And these are the things that I think, regardless of your curriculum, actually make a difference. So that's what I hope we're going to be looking at a bit today. OK, a little bit in the new curriculum on light. This is a bit that comes up, and it often causes a bit of problems. This, well, there's two problems, really. One is that it's enormously difficult, and nod if you would agree with this, to have total blackout in the classroom so you can really see what light is doing. <laughs> Some teachers try and find a completely dark cupboard and lock all the children in there to give them that experience. But on the whole, um, it's really difficult to do. Whatever you do, there's a little bit of light seeps in. If you're from London, your children will never experience total darkness. You have to come to Wales, where, where I live, and you have to go down a mine to really be aware of what it's like when you cannot see your hand in front of your face. So that's one problem that we have, and getting them to understand the importance of light. The other problem is this. This is how we see. And if you ask a child, how do you see that bottle on the table? Right? This is what they think. The light, they know something to do with light, so the light comes into my eyes, turns it round and shoots it out like Superman <laughs> so that I can see. And it's a really difficult thing to get them to realise that the light actually goes into your eyes rather than comes zooming out because they feel that seeing is an active thing. They do it. It's called the active eye. You have a, a bag like this which has a bit of black card in and you now have to roll it up lengthways like that to make a tube. Excellent, you're doing just what I wanted. You thought you were being naughty, but no. OK, what I want you to do and what you can do with the kids is to say, now, you've got good eyes, so you'll be able to look through this and see what's the other side. So, you know, it's put, put it on. I can see you. Pass it round, make sure you're all very good at looking. <laughs> I, I have to say, I did do this once and said, make sure you're all good lookers. Well, I mean, you're really <laughs> handsome, but, you know, OK. So now what you say to them is after they've done this and they go, yeah, I can see the other side, that's brilliant because I'm looking. You now get them to put it down on something to read, something, picture, whatever. And you say, OK, so you put it down like this and if you look down there, obviously you're going to be able to see what's at the other end, aren't you? Have a go and try and pass it down the line. <laughs> oh dear, there's a bit of a problem. What do we need? We need a bit of light. Good. And now you have a pair of scissors. And what I'm going to ask you to do is just, and I suggest just sort of squeeze it together, do a little cut into it like that, because you're going to make a hole near the top of the tube here to let the light in, which could then go up to your eye and you could shoot it down to see what's happening. Have a go now, see what's there. Am I finding that there's still a little bit of a problem? Well, that's a bit surprising, isn't it? Because looking down there, and the light comes in there, it travels in straight lines, we know that, it can go that way. It could go up to our eye. But it could go down there. But, do you know, it doesn't seem to help. That's a bit weird. So I now wonder if what you could do is just a very simple turn it that way round. And this is where it's one of the few lectures where somebody will say, and get out your mobile phones. Because what I'd like you to do is have a torch shining in through that hole, because it just accentuates it, and do the torch going up to your eye, across and down at the object, and see what makes the biggest difference, OK? Have a look at the difference when you point the, the light down onto the object or across. So when we look at the light coming in here, the light travelling in straight lines, there's our eye, it could go that way, it could go lots of ways. It could, though, go down that way and then get reflected again in straight lines going off in all directions, but some of it will go up and into our eye, enabling us to see the light. And I think one of the things we want to try and do with children is always talk about the light's journey. Where did it start? Where did it go to next? Where did it end up? And I think if you do that, that really can help make sense of it for kids. If a child can say to you, I used to think that. 
and now I think this. And I can tell you why. I used to think that I was wrong, now I think this. Because we did something with a black paper tube and it helped me. That's it. That shows learning. Never mind levels or non-levels or mastery or all the other terms that are coming in. That's what we want to see happening in our schools. Um, and sometimes it might be that they still think the same thing. That's fine too. Uh, but as long as they now know why and can tell you why they still think the same thing. Really simple. But I think that's what we need to keep in our minds when we're in our classrooms. I know you have to do the rest. Give it lip service, you know. <laughs> A bit of, st of straightforward science here. Are there any forces acting on this book? If so, what are they? Have a quick chat. Most people are pretty happy that there's, there's gravity. Am, am I right? Did that come into the conversations? You then come to this other one, which is something about mm, something possibly going up, maybe. Um, we kind of know we ought to do the arrow going up, and when the kids ask you, so what is that, you go, yeah, it's break time now, off you go. <laughs> and it's, it's one that's really tricky to actually believe. Uh, one of the things we want the children to believe is that that table is actually pushing up. But tables don't push. They haven't got hands, they haven't got muscles. How can they possibly do that? How can I believe that? Next object from your uh, pack, a balloon. Could somebody who's got a lot of breath blow it up, tie a knot in it? It doesn't need to be huge. <laughs> what I want you to do with these balloons, please, first bit is really simple. I just want you to hold it between two flat hands. Don't do this, just flat hands, because you'll feel it better. And push them towards each other to change the shape of the balloon, but not permanently, if you get my meaning. <laughs> You will find that to get it to change shape, you had to push with both hands. Am I right? Yes. You cannot possibly just push with one hand and have the other hand sitting there, because if you do, it moves. To get the change of shape, you've, just, you've got to have an active push from both sides, correct? Yes. Put your balloon down on the desk in front of you. Press down with one hand. If it changes shape, what must the desk be doing? Is that good? Yes. OK. <laughs> One of the things you still get with children, though, is they go, but I can't see it doing anything. It doesn't look like anything's going on. And I'm going to use Tracy here, not that she knows, but she was sitting there earlier, so I made friends with her, it's fine. Um, you're right with balloons. Yeah. Right, OK. I'm going to put this on Tracy's head, right, and I'm going to press down. If the balloon changes shape, what do we know Tracy's head must be doing? OK. And it does, but can we see her head doing anything? No. Can you feel something inside? <laughs> yes, like mad. <laughs> and you can really feel your neck muscles having to work to do it, but we can't see anything. So there's something going on inside these tables that we can't see that's still happening. Please try it on each other's heads. It's good fun. <laughs> OK, so I hope that helps if you come to that problem. It does seem to make a bit of a difference and get people to, to make some sort of sense of that. Different kinds of inquiries, which I'm going to flip through very quickly, but it is quite a big feature of the new curriculum. And actually, teaching children the skills of science. They don't know them by magic. I've never yet met a child who comes in with a ready-formed idea of what a bar chart is at five years old, you know. We've actually got to get in there and teach them some of these things. And I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about those. So, working scientifically, first of all, there are various different ways of finding out. You no longer just have to do a fair test. Fair testing is there. It's a great way of finding out, but it's not the only way. So the important question, really, with these different kinds of inquiries how does it work with biscuits? OK, so looking at one context, what would it look like, the different kinds of inquiry? So if you're looking at something changing over time, you might stick a biscuit in a beaker and pour on some hot water. If you haven't tried a fruit shortcake in hot water, give it a go. It's wonderful what it does, and it puffs up and it does all sorts of extraordinary things. Digestive's a bit more boring, but it's still interesting. You know, give it a go. But it's one thing changing over time. That's what we're doing, is looking at how that thing changes. Pattern seeking. 
That's really seeing if there's a link or connection. Not a strict fair test, often comes up in humans and the environment. Here, we might see if there was a link between fat and calories and do a sort of scatter graph to see if there was a link by reading this, the information off the back. OK? Shockingly, I find, boring digestives are one of the highest in both fat and calories. Whew. Never have a boring digestive again. It really, you know. <laughs> you can make a branching key diagram to do the classifying bit of this, identifying and classifying. Get a box of variety biscuits and get the kids to do a yes-no diagram all the way down to identify each of the biscuits. They quite enjoy that one, particularly eating the results. It's, it's good. <laughs> Which is the best dunking biscuit? Brilliant one to do. You know, dunk, 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 dunk. Peter Kay, eat your heart out because it blooming well isn't hobnobs. Have you seen that clip? <coughs> wonderful, wonderful. Anyway, but it's great fun. I'm researching using secondary sources, so just how on earth do they make jammy dodgers? You know, we're not going to be able to do that one in the classroom. Let's find out. But that's just the biscuit curriculum for you to take back and have a go with. <laughs> Now, one of the ways we test the breaking strength of threads is to usually stick a, a bag or something on the bottom and see how many bricks or whatever you put in it to make it break. I thought, wouldn't it be nice to do it this way and actually measure the force needed to break it? This was a really good idea. So the kids pulled until it went, and then they read the Newton meter, and it was always zero. Um, <laughs> so what you have to do instead is you have to actually... Uh, start to do it, and do do it slowly. Watch the marker move. Don't make the marker zoom up too fast or you'll never get it. But you need to do that across two people and then a person in the middle calls out the Newtons as they go. So like this would go one, two, three, four, and the last number, last whole number called is the number of Newtons it went at. Have a go. <laughs> So I'm doing this one to illustrate how you help children understand the purpose of repeat readings and get them to get an idea of why they do it. Because what we've done there, you all had the same thread all around the room, so we've got repeat readings. They're all identical length, promise, I measured them all carefully. <laughs> anyway, uh, but near enough, it's, it, it's good enough to go for. So one of the things that we found when you ask kids why do you do repeat readings Two common answers. One, to make it a fair test. Mm -mm, completely wrong. Two, because my teacher told me to. <laughs> um, and that's one of the things. I don't actually see the purpose of them. So the idea of this was to see the purpose of them. Right, people who had your Newton meters, can you yell out and can the rest of you write these down or somebody in your group write them down? It was? Eight. Eight. Seven. 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 Nine. 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 Ten. 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 Okay, and over here? 10, 10, 8. Are we that done? I think we're done. OK. Right. And the question to ask to get them to twig about repeat readings is to say, suppose I had one more bit of that dark blue thread and I was to do this one more time and you had to bet your last Roblo on the number of Newtons it was going to go at, what number would you go for? 10, 9, because more people had that number. Suppose we'd only done it once and it had been seven. What answer would you have to give? Because it's all you've got to go on. So can you see how doing it more often gives you a better idea of the likely result? Now, that's why we bother with it. It's not that we're finding the right answer which is out there somewhere in the ether, which is what they often think. We're just gradually amassing more and more evidence to actually see which one we should go for what seems most likely. I think that phrase, most likely, is pretty useful. So hang on to that. OK, finally, I want to talk about recording. That's children recording what they do in science. Nothing kills science like the phrase, now write about it. <laughs> it's not that I'm again a bit of decent writing now and again, but I think it needs to be short and to the point. So if you want to really focus on good explanations, then just get them to write the explanation. You know, that's the bit. But there's so many other ways to record. I think we have to think about why we bother to do it. Number one, jolly big font, jolly important reason. To help children learn. Number two, middling size font, middling important reason. To let them communicate with others. 
teensy-weensy font, teensy-weensy importance to provide evidence of what's been going on in the classroom. Do you ever feel the size of the fonts has got a bit muddled up when providing evidence seems more important than whether or not the kids have learnt anything? And we've just got to stop and think why we're in this business. It's to help kids learn. So what helps them learn? Talking back through what they've learnt, working with others to pick out the main points, chatting about a way of understand, a way of presenting it that shows what they've learnt. So it doesn't always have to be writing. There's lots of different ways for kids to show what they know. I'm sure you do a number of these. Um, these are all good, for, you know, people do this kind of thing. The radio or TV interview, two ways of doing it. Right, hello, it's Radio London here today. <laughs> and I believe we've been doing some really interesting science here. You've been doing something with a balloon. Could you tell me something that you did with your balloon today? It's all right, you don't have to. OK, <laughs> it's fine. Um, but you do that, and you do three questions. Then you put the kids in pairs. One has a pencil, one not. One's the interview, one's the responder. They've got to think of three good questions, three good responses. Brilliant. They're picking out the main points. The other way of doing it, and it's really good if you're doing something like filtering and sorting out the... You know, when you do all the things fell off my kitchen cupboard and in there was iron filings and <laughs> sugar and, you know, I mean, no wonder what on earth was in, your, when you, was in your kitchen cupboard. But you know all that sort of separating thing. Really good to have them coming down uh, and it's the Jeremy Kyle show. And today we have got, you know, it's Little Miss Sugar. How was it for you? And it's the Mr. Iron Filings. Over here, it's Miss Sand. Now, what happened from your point of view? And here, filter paper. OK? So what's been going on? And water, we could have them too. Tell us from your point of view, what was the story? And they just love doing that. And they put themselves in the position of the thing that they're working with, and then that really gets their imagination going. And finally, one of my favourites is, is everybody singing a song <laughs> and making up our own songs. Now, this was a year four class, and they'd done the breaking threads, but we'd done it not for repeat readings because they were only year four. What we'd done it for was to actually um, just do a simple sort of fair test and get the idea that if you were breaking different threads, they needed to be the same length. And they'd also had a lesson on how to use a Newton meter, because they hadn't met them before. So we'd had a lesson on what the Newton meter was, and we'd had lots of fun, you know, estimating pools and doing all that stuff. Um, and then we went on to actually try breaking the threads. And I gave them the task of actually seeing if they could make up a song to a favourite nursery rhyme or something simple that they knew, right? And I actually then left, because I was sort of doing a demo lesson and I went to chat to some other teachers, and left them actually on their own with a supply teacher who had no idea what had been going on. And they came up with a fantastic range of songs. And they left that lesson singing and <coughs> laughing and chatting about their science. Yes! I don't think they do that after written reports, always. <laughs> Let's just have a go at this one. This is, to the, this is from two kids um, to the tune of Twinkle Twinkle. So it's... <laughs> OK, now you have to do it with me or I feel a right plonker, OK? <laughs> so here's their tune. Right, here we go then. Newtons, Newtons, what are they? They measure pools we learn today. Pull a string to do the test. Fair test, fair test, they're the best. Strings, they all go pong and ping. We learn science and we sing. Wonderful. Very tuneful. Fantastic. So, just wrapping it up then, how do we spot good learning in science? The things that really matter, children, talking to each other and thinking. Children who can't wait to tell you the new things that they've learnt. Children who see the point of science skills. Children who show what they know in science in a variety of interesting ways. And children and teachers smiling in their science lesson. And I believe these are the new Ofsted criteria for science. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only, if only. <laughs> But really, you know, if you're looking at, at colleagues teaching, I really do think this is the stuff we need to be looking out for. It's so important, and it will turn kids on to science. OK, so thank you very much for listening. Make it come alive. Focus on what's important for learning. And the very best of luck. <laughs>